good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on which continent you're um, in. I am Borchen Nell. I'm the executive director of the Institute for Policy Integrity at New York University School of Law. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar that Florence School of Regulation and Policy Integrity are co-hosting. Institute for Policy Integrity is a nonpartisan academic think tank dedicated to improving the quality of US governmental decision making. We use economics and law to support smart policies for the environment, public health, and consumers. The Florence School of Regulation is a center of excellence for independent discussion and knowledge exchange with the purpose of improving the quality of European regulation and policy. They deliver academic research, training, and policy events in energy, climate, transport, and water and waste. So both of our institutions are a combination of an academic research group, a think tank, and an education institute. And I'm so grateful for their partnership for um, this event. Our goal in today's conversation is to have a global dialogue about the significant legislation happening on either side of the Atlantic and their global impact. In the US, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as the Infra Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The EU has Net Zero Industrial Act and Critical Raw Material um, Act. These are definitely critical steps in the global race towards net zero. At the same time, we all know that they have considerable impacts for their regions, as well as on a global scale due to their relevance to securing critical raw materials. And we know that sourcing these materials can create a range of economic, social, and geopolitical concerns. So today we will examine some of the key provisions of these um, policies, the approaches embedded with these acts, and shed light on their potential to drive innovation, mitigate environmental impacts, and reshape industrial um, landscapes. So I truly look forward to the conversation. And without further ado, I want to turn the microphone to Andres and Christopher to introduce our speakers and moderate. Thank you, Burjan. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I would like to introduce the first keynote presentation uh, by Paola Pino. Uh, Paola, thank you for joining. <clears throat> we know how exhausting this time is for European Commission. Congratulations of file closed and all the good success for still files open. Uh, uh, Paola Pino has, I think, from all Commission officials, uh, most knowledge of uh, energy policy because she stayed in different capacities in EU Commission dealing with energy for for quite a substantial time. So she really is a best expert that we could get from European Commission. And uh, without any further hesitation, Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew, so much for such kind uh, kind words, which I definitely don't deserve. And uh, it goes to the team, to all the teams, and indeed uh, we didn't know when planning uh, when you when you suggested uh, that we participate in this in this debate, we would not have anticipated that we actually managed to have a political agreement on the Critical Raw Materials Act uh, just uh, uh, just this week. So so really very very timely uh, and uh, very timely uh, discussion. So a big pleasure to be with you um, today and. Um, well, let me just start by, by by setting the scene, right? We are in this in this decarbonization journey uh, where the end target is uh, becoming climate neutral, becoming the first climate neutral continent in, in the world by 2050 with very clear targets between now and then, notably a very ambitious target of 42.5% of renewables in our final energy consumption uh, uh, by 2030. Uh, now, on top of that, as we all know, we really received a big wake-up call uh, with the war in Ukraine when our uh, uh, supplies of, uh, of fossil fuels, and in particular of gas, have been really weaponized by our main supplier of gas, which reminded us of the importance of, uh, of not 
overly depending on single uh, suppliers. So we've done incredible work together, all together, really, with the member states, with the, with the parliament, uh, with the, the, the industry, with the households in reducing our dependence over the past, uh, over the past year. Uh, and to actually boost in record times uh, the renewables uh, deployment to replace gas in power generation and, and in, in heating. Uh, we uh, uh, have beaten many records last year. For instance, it was the first time last year that in the midst of a crisis, the EU generated more electricity from wind and solar than from gas. This was uh, unprecedented. Uh, it was a record year for solar energy in the EU. Uh, with 41 gigawatt of new capacity installed, also a record uh, for wind capacity in terms of, of, uh, of, of installments. Um, but this also means that in order to deliver on this, on this massive uh, decarbonization journey, we will need huge amounts of critical raw materials. And if there's one thing that we need to uh, uh, do is to really learn from our from our mistakes and um, clearly uh, we cannot let this energy crisis that we've gone through go without learning the lesson and the lesson is very very clear we cannot uh, have over dependence on uh, uh, single suppliers uh, and we need to, um, to really from the outset when it is now when we're now uh, speaking about critical raw materials which will be the new element, which is critical for ensuring energy security in a decarbonized world, we need from the outset to make sure first that we diversify uh, our suppliers, that we establish strategic partnerships. Uh, and here we're looking at our partners and happy to see that, uh, that uh, we have also uh, the US represented uh, um, here today and um, with, uh, with, with Julia. It's clearly one of our strategic partners that we're looking to, um, to work on the critical raw materials. We need to ensure circularity of the critical raw materials from the outset, really making sure that um, we bring this into uh, the discussion and also into the practice uh, of the of the sourcing the processing and the use of the critical raw materials that we promote sustainability on critical raw materials and that we invest in innovative technologies which will not just reduce but in some cases even substitute the use of uh, critical raw materials for instance we're hearing more and more about sodium uh, batteries because uh, whether we're speaking about wind turbines, whether we're speaking about uh, uh, the polysilicon for the solar panels, whether we're speaking about um, the, 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 the copper that we need for the cables, it's all about critical uh, raw materials. So um, this is all tackled precisely in this critical raw materials uh, act and where we were very pleased to uh, reach a political agreement um, uh, on Monday. Um, and, and really, this is, as was uh, said in another event I participated today in the context of the Critical Raw Materials Week, this is just, quoting uh, uh, Churchill, is really just uh, the end of the beginning in the sense that now we have um, a set of rules which hopefully will be endorsed very soon and and really that sets the beginning of a chapter where we should be wiser where we have learned uh, our our lessons and that we will now really from the outset approach uh, the new uh, the new commodities for ensuring our energy uh, security uh, uh, in in a wiser manner now it's not just about the access to raw materials uh, that we need in order to really deliver on the decarbonization of the energy system. We also need to make sure that we have the necessary products uh, uh, available and that uh, we also have um, key, key, key production, domestic production of the so-called clean uh, uh, net zero energy uh, technologies so that we are not fully dependent on, on, on inputs. But let me uh, uh, say also something very, very clearly, because um, we know we are tackling now with the Net Zero Industry Act precisely 
the possibilities um, to, to also produce, manufacture in the EU some of these um, uh, critical um, uh, clean energy technologies. And some would say, is this protectionism? Well, it's definitely not protectionism because one thing is clear with the massive uh, dimension of what we have at stake. There's no way we can deliver on our own EU decarbonization, on our EU uh, transition without the partners, without international partners, without uh, many countries across the world. So that needs to be said very, very uh, clearly. Uh, but we need to also make sure that we have the conditions to produce some of it um, uh, internally in the EU to overcome the barriers to the scale up uh, uh, of the manufacturing of net zero technologies. And at the end of the day, that also other countries across the world can benefit from those net uh, uh, zero technologies. Uh, and of course, it is inevitable in such uh, uh, a topic then to, uh, to avoid the discussion about what other uh, countries are doing. And of course, here I would expect uh, Julia, to then also um, uh, tell us more about the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. And we get the question, how does this compare to what the EU uh, is doing? Um, and we don't know yet uh, whether, whether the uh, uh, IRA incentives uh, to relocate investment decisions for clean technology producers, um, to what extent they will have an impact on the EU, but it's clearly a, an issue. And it's, it's, it's good that there is such uh, a bold uh, action on the US side to also um, uh, decarbonize. Um, and as said, on our side, less on the subsidies uh, uh, part and the fiscal incentives where the EU is, is, does, doesn't have any competence, but the idea in the Net Zero Industry Act is to create the conditions, the regulatory conditions, um, to really also ensure competitiveness of the uh, European um, uh, industry for clean energy technologies in a way that, as said, in the end, everyone will be able to benefit from it because, fortunately, the EU is not the only uh, big region uh, who is, has, has engaged in this uh, decarbonization uh, journey. And hence, just as a final word to, again, emphasize that our goals can really only be realized through uh, collective uh, global action, through commitment and efforts of all stakeholders across the board, from uh, policymakers to industry to citizens, and uh, in cooperation with our uh, strategic uh, partners. Uh, there's no other way, and uh, I think this discussion and the way it is uh, structured is, is also an example of that. Thank you very much for this opportunity, um, uh, and back, back to, uh, back to uh, you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. It was really a great introduction. Um, our next speaker is Robbie Diamond. Uh, Robbie is the founder, president, and CEO of SAFE. SAFE enhances energy security and supports U.S. economic resurgence and resilience by advancing transformative transformation, transportation and mobility technologies while ensuring that the United States and allies secure key aspects of the technology supply chain. Um, Robbie is also now very active in Europe, so I have met him so here on European soil. So, Robbie, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, for people who don't know, um, uh, former Commissioner Pilbugs is going to join our uh, Energy Security Leadership Council Europe, which is soon to be announced, and we're very excited about that. So great that uh, you got to make the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, as you heard, Robbie Diamond. Um, I started in 2004 this organization called SAFE. Um, to It started to end oil dependence for economic and national security in 2004. It was very focused on the U.S. initially. Um, and, you know, at that time, we were fighting two wars. We had a global war on terror, you know, and it's all related to resource. Because there's one thing in human history that I think has been shown over and over again is that countries go to war over resources and over energy. And, uh, and it just seemed crazy that we'd be wasting so much blood and treasure um, and having uh, these debates of uh, drill more, use less. And so as an organization, we brought together four-star admirals and generals and CEOs 
to advocate for producing what we can domestically with high standards, which I'll get into that, and uh, we're using it as efficiently as possible. So we squeeze every molecule, every every dollar of GDP out of every molecule. Why should we be less efficient? And then finally, um, uh, at the time, it was really focused on oil. So go to electrification. This is before electric cars, because you use diverse domestic and stable priced fuels. And clearly, that's uh, been taking off now um, in many ways. The market is up and down. But uh, you know, we are at a moment. I think it's not a question of the destination. We'll get there. The question is how long it will take us to get there as we go from a fossil fuel based world to a materials to a minerals based world. Um, and that, that's really the question. And, and honestly, the debate has moved forward light, light years from uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, before, you know, people didn't talk about minerals. And now everyone talks about minerals. But at the same time, I think what we are doing about it is probably completely insufficient to the task, unserious for the moment. Um, and, uh, and maybe I'll speak a little bit, um, you know, about that. Um, you know, I, I guess I'd go back one second and say, well, why this group that was focused on oil now focuses on uh, minerals, on strategic materials. So just for people to know, we have a critical mineral center. We have a strategic material center. We have a semiconductor center. And that's because about eight years ago, we were thinking about this. And here's an organization trying to live by our values and oil dependence, not go to war over these things. And we were basically said, oh, we're going to go from the Saudi frying pan into the Beijing battery fire. Or in the European context, although they too are in the Saudi frying pan, but they were in the Russia frying pan and going to the Beijing battery fire. And, and to us, that, that would be a crazy outcome, as you just heard uh, from, the last, uh, from the last speaker, um, which is, is so important. We have this moment, um, but yet we are uh, nowhere so far up to uh, that task. You know, I'm sure people on this call have heard how many more materials we need. You know, 384 mines are going to be needed for graphite, lithium, cobalt, nickel by 2035. Since the IRA was passed, 20, 23 times the amount of materials are going to be needed by the United States um, in those areas. Uh, copper, which isn't even part of the batteries. You know, we're going to have to mine over the next two and a half decades more copper than all of human history. So everyone's sort of talking about that. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. I think people people understand. Um, and then, you know, people talk about these rocks. But then, um, as you just heard, it's a comprehensive approach, which I will talk about, which is about processing them, about precursor, turning them into precursor materials and then turning them into uh, something. It's also everyone talks about China basically owning this. Uh, I, I noted before Saudi Arabia, which, of course, is part of OPEC, which is a cartel. Uh, not practicing the economic uh, world that both Europe and the United States uh, espouse of uh, free markets. And uh, and yet uh, China is OPEC squared. Not only they not <laughs> have a coalition of partners, they own so much of the space and minerals and processing that uh, they control the uh, entire market. And I will uh, you know touch on that um, as a moment as well. I've, I've left so many dangling things that I'm going to touch on but I just wanted to introduce, um, you know, these sort of uh, these uh, these narrative lines. Um, so, so first of all, I think it's not just about energy and this new energy. You know, I think also we are living in a very unstable world. We've got a war in the Ukraine. We now have a you know a war in the Middle East. You know, uh, China is a volatile situation. I mean, I let forget Taiwan, forget Hong Kong for a moment. Just in the South China Seas, for people who don't follow this. The Chinese are ramming Philippine boats. Okay, how how could that possibly end? They're flying within 10, um, 10 feet of uh, or ten meters of uh, of U.S. Uh, airplanes. So I, I just see it so volatile. And yes, the the she is meeting with uh, President Biden today, but um, you know that's a lot of talk, um, but not necessarily on the ground where where things are so hot. So. We we all not only need these these minerals for uh, energy, but we need these minerals for everything else in an industry, including weapon systems, which everyone now is saying, like, we don't have the industrial base to do that. As I like to say, if it's in an F-150 Lightning and an F-35, those are the same materials. The cobalt, for instance, you know, in an F-35, you use cobalt for the paint so you can't see it in the engine so it doesn't overheat and the display um, in the batteries. So um 
it, it's just totally, you know, one has to think about the massive amount that's going to be needed, um, you know, for both for both these uh, questions that are, are important questions of our time. From this comprehensive approach we just talked about, again, um, and it's good that we talked about energy and started with energy, um, because um, you not only need the materials, but then you need the energy to turn those things into something. Um, you know, the deindustrialization of what of Europe, of the United States itself has happened because of energy. Um, you know, the smelters that are being closed for aluminum, let's say, you know, there's a, there's a handful left in the United States. Um, that's because to crush rock, to smelt, to process, to do these things requires cheap, abundant, reliable energy. Um, but if you're on the stock exchange, it also requires clean energy. And so this question of the energy we need today to get to this minerals-based world versus getting rid of that energy and maybe shutting it down for a system we don't yet have, I think is a fundamentally important question for us all to ask ourselves. And that is not to slow the transition, but to understand what that transition, what these mid-transition wor world looks like. I'm in Washington, D.C., the politics, which I will uh, get into, is that every, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin once said, uh, there are two certainties in life, death and taxes. I would add that politicians will always make sure your gas tank is full and your lights go on. So in the Ukraine situation, when they ran into a crisis, what do you do? You, you, you do the worst situation. You know, you, you, you turn on the coal plants. Um, if you had been ready with natural gas, maybe with this diversity we just heard from or this or, or nuclear or other things, you might not do that. So it's not a question of uh, of uh, stopping the transition, but asking ourselves the question, what does the mid-transition uh, years look like? Because crisis leads to bad outcome, and I don't think, and it also leads to lack of political support, as we've seen both here in the United States and in Europe, a, you know, a, a movement to maybe reverse um, some some of these trends if you look at the uh, elections and, and, and what. So, so to me, the comprehensive question is, okay, where do we get these materials from? Both uh, in our own borders and and in the global south and other places, what? How do we move that fast? You know, not wait fifteen years for a mine. Um, how do we make sure once we get those materials and, we'll, and what are the standards to do that? And we'll talk about that. But then, how do you then you know recycle, which we talk about, but you know we're not anywhere near recycling. You know, we have twenty million, twenty five million global electric cars, something like that. Maybe we have like one point three billion others. Okay, you can't recycle. We have a, a denominator numerator problem. So, but once we have these vehicles or other materials in our, we can just, you know, those are above ground mines. So I see it as a national security issue. People call it circularity. Um, and then again, this China question, which I think is really the fundamental question. And I don't think we've, we've addressed it. Or this question of demo democracies versus authoritarians. Basically, when you have opaque supply chains, vertically integrated from the mine to the final product, and you have governments with unlimited money able to support, there's going to be manipulation, which is what we're seeing throughout that process. And so it is very hard for uh, market-based economies, which have public markets, where they have companies that are making quarter to quarter decisions to compete with that. And that's why I do think we are in a new economic era and we have to ask ourselves more fundamental questions about how we compete. Because I believe that governments in the United States with the IRA will support a mine here, processing facilities there, and then find that those are, that those are not able to withstand the volatility of the market. And that market is being manipulated. So some examples would be cobalt was just flooded into the market. A mine in the United States, Gervois, the first what was going to be a cobalt mine, was worth the company was worth a billion dollars, then went down to 100 million and they stopped their cobalt mine because the market was being flooded um, with this material. How do you compete? You know, what you then have is a distressed asset, which others are going to try to pick up, mostly the Chinese. So I think that we have to rethink this model um, to create a new economic order that is radically transparent, which works for democracies. Um, from the mine to the final product or from the well to the final uh, use, that it has to be infused with our values of human rights, uh, labor standards, child labor, and uh, environment. 
that we will all pay uh, a little more, acknowledge that, but that it's enforced at borders and that there are inspection mechanisms for that. And then finally, we all do it together. That's Australia, Canada, United States, Europe, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and 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 I think that if we do that and are and and are serious, and it's also to say that we can allow uh, China, which is the biggest peer competitor, which has all the manufacturing, to create a dirty system over here and launder their coal emissions into our clean energy products, and then you know sell us the raw materials over here that they might use cleaner facilities for. And that's why total um, a transparency is a really an important uh, mechanism in, in our view. Um, just from the political and the IRA, you know, we were very involved in writing a lot of the IRA, specifically the supply chain provisions. I would say to my European uh, counterparts, we uh, we were definitely uh, about NATO and uh, non-NATO military allies, not uh, free trade countries. We also felt that there should be a ramp. Um, and because, you know, European countries do, you know, an incredible uh, amount um, of different parts of the supply chain. So that was a big uh, mistake. But overall, I think it was a good signal. Um, and I do think that the WTO and I do think the rules based world that we have come to know from a global basis is, is broken and it's not going to be fixed. And therefore, I think that uh, rules based countries have to get together and create, like we did in post-World War II, what does this radically transparent new order look like? And we should compete against each other fairly, but we can't allow people who are not competing fairly to be in. We have some issues uh, in the United States, uh, you know, electoral issues and, and in Europe. I'd say that uh, Democrats have a math problem when it comes to all this, in that they don't realize how much is really needed for this transition, minerals and things. Are they really willing to open the mines? Every mine is a problem. It's got a water problem. It's got an energy problem. It's got an indigenous problem. But, you know, are we willing to do that? Those are trade-offs. Those are clear trade-offs that one has to have a real discussion about. There is no perfection. Both here and in, the, it's called the global south. Republicans have a science problem or they have a, you know, they've turned it into a cultural um, issue. So we have to get beyond that. But again, I don't need them to buy into an, a climate agenda. We just need to turn them from negative to neutral. Their states are the ones that are most benefiting. And then I think in Europe, we do have a problem. I think we have a China problem. Um, again, we're uh, less dependent here from an economic perspective, but I, I don't see the future going well. And because I don't feel the future going well, um, you know, I, it's great that the EU, you know, announced, you know, the looking into the auto industry, but, you know, the Germany was, um, um, you know, was, was against that. So, um, so anyways, the last point that I will make is, you know, we have governments saying the right things, but then they don't make investments, real investments. And so we at SAFE have created a partnership uh, right now with the State Department called MinVest, where we're bringing the private sector. So governments can identify projects, but then they need the private sector to invest in them. And some of the things that the governments can do is bring their economic, their diplomatic um, and other types of, uh, you know, de-risking for these companies that are making very difficult decisions in some places that are very politically, um, you know, not not perfect, uh, you know, if you're a market based uh, 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 company, but even um, in Europe or in Australia or in Canada or in the United States, you know, they have these timelines that are so long. So I would just say that it's very important to bring the private sector along, even though the government is making um, um is 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 uh is 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 uh doing saying the right thing. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bobby. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Elias um, Ziga. Uh, he's from the African School of Regulations. That is new entity, but it's very much follows the logic of the continent. Elias, the floor is yours. Okay, Andres, thank you so much, and um, thank you, Paula and Robbie, for your introductory remarks. Uh, I think most of <clears throat> what I wanted to cover in the first session of my presentation has already been said, especially regarding the, the importance of the critical role uh, minerals, especially for uh, the energy to drive the energy transition. So I just have a brief slide that I want to share. 
if you don't mind. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, so basically uh, a bit of introduction about myself. Uh, I'm Elia Ziga, I'm a research associate at the African School of Regulation. And um, we are more concerned about uh, designing the some regulatory framework to uh, address the regulatory barriers that are impeding universal access to energy in Africa and also to develop a more, provide insight into policies to develop a more robust energy markets in Africa. And as most of you are aware already, Africa is struggling with uh, energy issues and also happen to be the continent where most of these critical minerals that we are talking about are uh, heavily uh, are in huge amounts or have huge reserves of most of these minerals. So, uh, so uh, like I said, the role of critical raw uh, mineral like cobalt uh, lithium and uh, uh, cotton, uh, which of course we have uh, heard in the previous two speakers, are uh, extremely important to drive this transition and also the the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act and the EU Net Zero and the Critical Raw Mineral Act uh, also uh, places more emphasis on these uh, minerals. And uh, where Africa comes into this conversation is because uh, it happens to host or uh, to hold a huge deposit of most of these uh, uh, raw minerals and uh, and also given that there's a huge demand now uh, especially resulting from the impact of the of the inflation reduction act and also the net zero uh, and uh, the critical raw mineral act for these particular uh, uh, minerals there's a huge demand for this mineral which i'll be showing uh, uh, in just a uh, uh, in, in just a few moments. And also, this is also driving the scale up uh, of the, the some of the exploration and production of these minerals. And again, Africa being uh, one of the continents uh, which happen to be blessed with most of this mineral, it means that there's going to be uh, a question for Africa. So where does Africa fit in this global discussion? Uh, about these critical raw minerals. And basically, I'm going to be exploring my presentation from that angle. Sorry. But before I continue, I just want to give you a brief uh, uh, statistics that most of us know already. You know, 1.4 billion people, but the sad thing is that about 600 million people are without electricity access. And this is something that is of uh, a great importance to us at African School of Regulation, and we're trying to find means and ways to uh, uh, design the sound regulatory policies to address this issue. And this issue is not only about regulation. In fact, regulation plays a huge role designing the right regulatory framework to address the barriers to driving investment in the sector to bridge the access gap. But funding is also very important. In, in addressing the energy access gap in Africa. And this is where we find that the, the critical raw materials or minerals that are abundant in reserves in Africa, revenues from this uh, uh, sale, giving the new boost to uh, these critical minerals could help uh, African governments to leverage on these revenues to address the infrastructure gap in order to provide access to energy for their people. So this is something that is very important and also, there's also the discussion that this could be a double-edged sword for Africa. Uh, I say this because uh, we are all aware of the, the story of the resource case. You know, sometimes we all know the stories behind the uh, extraction of some of these minerals. And uh, I would uh, encourage our listeners and mostly to uh, have a look at the DW documentary in Congo about the environmental impact, the social impact of extracting these uh, minerals and also the issues about human rights, labor rights and stuff regarding all these things. So let me just paint a picture for you, for you to understand that when a mine is open and if there are no proper uh, legislative instruments or maybe responsible and sustainable mining practices, the people lose their farmland they lose their natural or the traditional way of life. Their water get poisoned. And 
at the end of the day, they are exposed to all sort of health issues and they don't even have the money to afford the proper medical care. And they end up being poorer than they were before. So in as much as there's a rush for all these uh, critical raw minerals and also a huge boost in the, de uh, in the demand and the exploration and production of all these minerals, at the end of the day, if care is not taken, some people are going to have to pay the unfortunate price for this. So there must be means and ways to address this issue. And that is basically the issue about the one side of the sword. The other side is that Africa grappling with all these resources, uh, infrastructure deficit and stuff, we need to forward development and having a huge deposit of most of this mineral, which I'll be showing uh, shortly, you know, stand at a great advantage, you know, and can capitalize on this opportunity to boost its revenue, get a needed uh, revenue from this minerals to address most of the social and uh, other uh, developmental uh, challenges or meet its infrastructure gap. So that is basically about a double sword issue for this mineral. And which path is Africa likely to go? And I think that it's not a question for only African leaders, but as we are in the era of sustainability and uh, responsible and uh, money, I think that it is a question for, for all of us, both uh, Africans and uh, their international uh, partners. So uh, according to the IEA, as we can see the demand for most of these minerals are rising really high. We are all very familiar with all these uh, graphs and uh, projections and how really steep the demand for most of these minerals are. So I'm not gonna go much into that detail, but I just want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, Africa holds over 40% of these global critical raw minerals. And uh, sometimes if you look at it, depend, this is uh, the official figure from the IEA. But if you want to look into some of the details, uh, especially from this graph from uh, uh, the Natural Resource uh, Governance Institute, as we can see, some of them are as high as 91%, especially in South Africa, where uh, the number for uh, where uh, uh, I think this one has to do with the lit, um, platinum, yeah, about 91% of the world reserve. And we can see in DRC uh, for the phosphate, 70%. This is just to highlight a few of the figures. And in Congo, cobalt, uh, which is one of the, the major uh, minerals being talked about lately, about 50% of the world reserve. So this shows that in as much as all these art are driving huge demand for this mineral, of course, Africa is going to play a very important role in this new transforming uh, global agenda. And uh, it, is, uh, it presents African countries with great opportunities uh, to sort of like leverage on this uh, new demand for these minerals to also meet their developmental needs as well. And for Africans to, or African government to do this, it is important that there must be a need for a robust governance and infrastructure in order to leverage on this uh, opportunity that uh, this critical mineral presents. And also, it is also important to put in the right regulatory frameworks to address the environmental and social impact of these critical minerals. Now, uh, African governments must also, for me, and also how I'm looking at this is that it, in as much as this is a great opportunity for Africans, the, the various governments must also take initiatives like have ownership, take ownership of this, uh, this new era or this new dawn for critical raw minerals and invest heavily in them by themselves. This is just a brief, uh, this slide is just a brief overview of the historical perspective about trade with the US because having US in the, in the EU or the international partners and having a, a huge abundance reserve of these minerals, in, it is uh, inevitable. It, it is very inevitable that Africa is definitely going to have to again enter into a, a different form of trade with its international partners. 
And uh, we know the historical uh, trade dynamics in, in Africa and through the various uh, trade agreements, but mostly most of the trade uh, are being skewed where Africa happened to be only uh, sort of like a, a exporter of uh, raw minerals, you know, and then buying the finished good. But I think that uh, in this era that we are uh, with a with agenda to drive development in Africa uh, and also to address most of the social problems, it is important that uh, there's a paradigm shift in the trade ag arrangement with the uh, international partners when it comes to the uh, the sale of or the exploration development of some of these minerals. So there must be local processing area, recycling of the minerals, investment in mining infrastructure, and there must be, uh, there's also emphasis on the business friendliness that Africa must create to, in order to at, uh, attract the investment in this sector. The last time I was listening to a presentation and I had a, present, a representative from the African Development Bank, you know, citing a very important example that uh, it could even be economically more competitive to produce some of the batteries, you know, from uh, in Africa, especially in Congo, than producing them in elsewhere, like the U.S. or uh, or in the EU. And this uh, report they commissioned for the uh, the commission that was done for them by the uh, by the Bloomberg. So it is important to start thinking about, you know, uh, in the interest of fair trade to start also processing or developing some of these uh, so, uh, value chain in Africa to also allow the Africans to also have access to jobs and also other opportunities that could also drive the economy in Africa. And this could address a lot of social issues relating to migration and other things that I don't really want to go into now. So now, uh, and also again, it is extremely important to protect mining communities. As I've highlighted in the very uh, in the beginning, when a mine is open, we all know what happens when there's no sustainable and standard mining practices. So it is important to protect the mining communities. And this is also in two folds. In the first place, I know that the EU, they are doing something really great in this regard, you know, tracking the supply line or up to the battery where the various minerals are taken from and stuff, which is very important. And I think that this needs to be reinforced to ensure that people who within the supply line are following the good practices and responsible mining practices to ensure that the various communities that most of these uh, resources are being exploited from do not end up becoming worse than they were. I mean, do not end up becoming worse than they were before. So it is important to put in good legislations, policies to make sure to address some of these challenges. And it's also extremely important for African governments to also put in or to renegotiate some of the mining agreements to ensure that this, the good standards are being followed and also to protect the environment. These are very, very important to protect the environment, to protect vulnerable communities. And I know I'm running out of time, so I, I would just, um, Okay, this is also extremely important. Again, building a sustainable future, it is extremely important for the African uh, governments to also put in place because this presents a huge opportunity for Africa. However, opportunity, they say, or the success, they say sometimes uh, when opportunity meets preparation. So Africans must be able to uh, invest in research and development, you know, acquisition of data and building the capacity to be able to uh, allow or to make it more convenient for international players to establish some of the factories in Africa because they know that the resource in terms of the human resource is there to drive some of this development. We don't want a situation where maybe most uh, Africans are advocating, okay, but build uh, manufacturing uh, lines to produce these batteries or to produce some of the, to process some of the minerals in Africa. Meanwhile, the resource or the human capacity is not available to meet this. So there must be huge investment in building capacity, research and development. And also revenue from these uh, minerals must also go again, which is very important to the development of the various communities in line with the UN Sustainable Goal. It is extremely important for people who are suffering from uh, this mining 
uh, mining of these critical minerals also benefit in terms of the revenues that must be distributed. And again, this is a, a universal call. It's not just on the African governments alone, but <coughs> excuse me, but also um, most of the international players must also play by the uh, good standards to ensure that there's some form of developmental or social activities taking place in where some of these minerals are being extracted. With this, I would like to end here and thank you so much again for inviting me and uh, I, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elias. Now I pass the floor to Christopher to introduce the uh, uh, debate and lead the debate. Christopher, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Andrew. So we have a panel of four, um, probably the four best people I could think of to discuss this in a way. Uh, we've got Melissa Barbanel uh, from the International, uh, who's, sorry, the Director of International Engagement at the World Resources Institute. Christian Ruby, who's the head of Euroelectric, um, who's not only one of the key players, actors, influencers in relation to the electrification of Europe's economy and the huge challenges um, this, that that involves, but also one of the key thinkers in this area as well. Um, we have Jesse Scott, who's um, who's who's been a a key actor and thinker in the European energy space for quite some time and is now at Hertie School. And, for, and finally, Joseph Kahn from the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm going to start with Melissa, if I may, uh, and perhaps um, I'd, I'd ask you to explain to us a little bit what the World Resources Institute does well before you start. Um, but I'd like to give you the floor for the, your comments on it, on the, the things we've heard. But, um, I, I'll tell you already, I'm, I'm going to um, tor torture you a little bit on the, um, uh, the era, um, because there's a lot of good things about it, of course. Um, but I am going to ask you as a European, um, is, it is it enough? Is it appropriate? And is it sustainable? Let me explain those three questions. Is it enough? Yeah, okay. You're spending, according to your government, 300 billion over the next 10 years on green technologies. According to Goldman Sachs, it's a trillion. Um, but hang on a minute. Um, 300 billion is not point over 10 years is 0.1% of um, US GDP over that period. So is spending 0.1% of US GDP on energy transition technologies? enough to actually deal with the US contribution to climate change? And will it actually deliver greenhouse gas reductions? Won't it just deliver some technologies which will do a marginal difference? Will it make a difference? Um, is it appropriate? Because it's, it's not really incentivizing people to really save greenhouse gases. It's incentivizing people to make money. It's a gold rush. Um, Thirdly, is it is it actually sustainable? Because what the US has done is they've said, OK, we'll give you um, uh, a subsidy for renewable electricity. Then we'll give you three bucks a kilo if you make um, green hydrogen. And then we'll give you another load of money if you turn that into um, sustainable aviation fuel, for example. Um, what we found in Europe is when you do a type of fixed premium or feed-in tariff, three or four years down the road, you realize everybody's running to the bank and making huge amounts of money and you have to change your mind. Um, so I'd, please feel free to mention anything you like, but, um, uh, but the is it enough? Is it appropriate? Is it sustainable? I think is one of the questions that we're asking in Europe. I will try to answer all those questions in my allotted time. Um, thank you for inviting me. I am Melissa Barbin. I'm the director of U.S. International Engagement for the World Resources Institute's U.S. office. Um, I'm also uh, co-leading WRI global energy team's efforts uh, to focus on energy minerals and circularity. Uh, in that role, we are developing um, a series of work focusing on really responsible mining, um, geopolitics, circularity, 
looking at a range of issues, everything from indigenous peoples to water uh, to everything, you know, that's sort of covered there. Uh, just for background, my background, I'm an attorney environmental lawyer by training. Um, however, I spent 15 years working for the mining industry uh, doing sustainability. So I'm very intimately involved with understanding what that entails and where it's hard and where it works well. Um, I will turn to your questions. Um, is the IRA enough? Will it reduce greenhouse gas emissions? I think I think that's a very fair question. Um, you know, the IRA is built on the notion that it is incentivizing innovation. Uh, it's the first time that we're having this sort of 10 year on ramp of uh, of incentives. So that really provides an opportunity to get uh, new technology in place and to get it to stick. I think that that is largely the rationale of the IRA is that you know by creating incentives and by uh, setting up a world where we are, are going to see innovation we're going to see um you know the creation of hydrogen hubs and uh you know new um new solar new uh you know a range of technologies that are going to drive uh clean energy development in the United States, I do think that there is a, a reasonable likelihood and predictions are that we are now within range of hitting our NDC, uh, which we were not prior to the IRA. So I do think that, you know, it is being seen and, and the research being done uh, says that it will be effective in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It is not simply a gold rush, as you said. Um, and then, you know, is it sustainable? I mean, I think that again, the idea is that these, sorry, these on-ramps, these 10 year on-ramps uh, allow an opportunity to get uh, these industries to be very, very well established and ensconced. And once you do that, you can see a change uh, in the way that we're running things and, and the way that we produce our energy. I mean, that's obviously the goal. The goal is to change the way we produce our energy. The goal is to see more EVs on the road. Um, and I do think that it's all about creating the platform to get that in place and get that started. Um, so that's kind of my take on that. I do think that uh, the question about whether incentives are an appropriate approach, I mean, we recognize, everybody recognizes that the U.S. and the EU approaches are very different uh, with the U.S. Uh, having to go with a full carrot route, although there is the methane fees um, whereas the EU has been able to, you know, create a carbon price. Um, in the United States, we simply are not at a place right now where we're imagining that there's a lot of opportunity to establish carbon price. So given that, given where we are, given the uh, need to reduce emissions, uh, the incentive approach is what is politically feasible in the United States to get it done. So I actually think it is appropriate. And, you know, as the administration has said repeatedly, it is a model that others can uh, and are looking at. So I, I don't really lose a lot of sleep over that. Um, I want to spend my last minute just to talk a little bit more broadly. Um, you know, when we're thinking about this topic in general and we're thinking about the mining sector, we're thinking about responsible mining, uh, you know, and one of the things Elias talked about is uh, the SDGs. And when we think about this, um, you know, mining by its nature is extractive. It's not sustainable, um, but it can support the SDGs. Um, and it does in many instances. You know, there's a really broad range in the mining industry. You have your major mining companies, many of whom, you know, your Western major mining companies, many of whom um, are reporting already under you know a range of standards whether that's GRI, OECD, IFC, UN guiding principles, the voluntary principles, the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, and then you have you know these organizations or some many of them are reporting in through a range of voluntary standards. Um, but it's also important to understand that there are junior miners who are your folks that are exploring and are um, you know not really well funded and tend to not be uh, reporting the same way. But the other thing that we need to talk about when we think about this topic is artisanal mining. According to PACT, 90% of the world's mining workforce is artisanal mining. Uh, and so when we think about this, we need to think about how do we help formalize that sector? How do we help drive improved uh, livelihoods for people? How do we address the underlying challenges of livelihoods to make that uh, you know more feasible and maybe less of an issue? Um, and 
that is my time. So I'm not going to go over time. I will uh, let the next person speak. And then uh, if there's questions, we can come back. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm still going to ask you another question, if I may. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, so as, as you heard earlier in the EU, we've adopted our Critical Raw Materials Act um, yesterday, the day before. Um, is the US trying to adopt a similar type of initiative? What's the US trying to do in order to try and choose, choose your term, level the playing field, um, have its own source, um, guarantee supply, choose your, choose your weapon? Uh, I would say there's two two things going on right now in the United States. Uh, first, there's the Mineral Security Partnership, where the European Commission is actually a party to that, along with a range of other developed countries and starting to have some other uh, developing countries be part of that. And the Mineral Security Partnership really is an effort to, I mean, there's, there's so many things going on. But the Mineral Security Partnership is one effort to identify projects where there can be investment uh, and to start working on the supply chain issues. There is the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative, uh, which is an effort of the US, Canada, Australia to improve mapping of resources. The US has just uh, proposed a regulation called uh, to amend what is called FAST 41, which is a, a, a permitting regulation that would speed up permitting for critical minerals mining, uh, recycling, and um, and some other supply chain beneficiation processing. So there's that's for domestic operations. So there's a whole, a, really a range. I could probably list off 20 different uh, things that are underway in the United States that are an effort to address this issue. Um, and a lot of them are external facing. A lot of them are international facing. Some of them are domestic facing. We have a lot of problems here in the United States with these domestic facing efforts. Uh, you know, there is... A lot of opposition, for instance, to this new Fast 41 proposal, you know, based on the history of mining and, and a lot of, you know, claims uh, about mining. Um, so there's that. There's also the IRA and the critical minerals agreements under the IRA. I think that the United States uh, is, you know, in the midst of working on a CMA with Indonesia. They are talking to the European Union about it. Uh, and, and actually, what's really fascinating about the CMAs is that it provides an opportunity to address a range of things. It provides, uh, provides an opportunity to address the security of supply issues for one, but also to drive responsible mining and responsible production uh, if they're done right. And I know that the um, US Trade Representative is thinking very hard about how to put together these sorts of an agreement, agreements in a way that ensures that we're getting responsibly sourced materials. Um, you know, it also, the CMAs are a way to address the sort of geopolitical issues, north-south issues, uh, and to potentially drive more processing into um, producing countries. So I think there's a really broad range of efforts uh, that are going on in the United States um, to try and ensure the security of supply. Terrific. Many thanks, Melissa. Uh, Jesse, um, the, so the, the EU has taking a different approach. We are not um, throwing uh, 300 billion or a trillion um, at industry to do green projects. We, um, we are taxing companies if they don't through the ETS. We've established a um, carbon border adjustment mechanism, which if you talk to the people who are going to be subject to it, will leak like a sieve. Uh, we're putting fuel obligations on our airplanes and our boats, fuel blending. Um, so we we are pricing carbon, which makes sense. Um, and at the same time, the US is creating a loud sucking sound from technology from Europe to the US. Question. Um, are we being naive here and... Does the net zero, will the net zero industry act be enough in order to redress this? What should we do? Well, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Andres, and to all the presenters. Sorry for a bit of background noise here. I'm speaking from an airport, um, therefore conscious also of my carbon footprint. Chris, I think you're asking here about you know, very different toolkits in the US and in Europe. And those are just facts of life in the political structures that we have. So 
really two questions arise. One of them is, is either of them enough um, in the domestic context to deliver on NDCs and all the targets that we've built around? And our wider ambitions to deliver a, a consensual green economy? So can we shift from the economy that we have to a green economy that is recognized as creating activity, jobs, opportunities by our domestic political electorates? And that's really a big challenge because a lot of the work we've done so far in the process of greening has been at the level of regulations of major corporates. Now we need to stretch out into other sectors. We're really beginning to realize what the scale up of renewables means, as Paolo was saying at the beginning. So different toolkits. The other question is how important it is that the toolkits are different. And that's really the background question to the debate that we're having about the IRA in the US, the European kit, but also the implications for other countries. I've just come back from Delhi and the Emirates. I listened to Elias very clearly on the African messages, many of which I recognize. What's the case for cooperation, right? As opposed to different regions going different ways to secure. The fundamental case is climate. It's very clear, and the IEA will say this, that the net zero emissions transition scenario is not possible. That degree of ambition achieving 1.5 degrees without international cooperation. So we need to drive forward domestic economies, but we also need to cooperate internationally. And that raises some interesting questions. Essentially, we're shifting here with the IRA, with the UK, um, the European approach, even some things in the UK, from a, a sort of liberal market vision of trade to a much more interest and values-based vision of trading systems and of the policies that we enact domestically support that. The EU has always had a slightly unilateral view of its interests and values. Um, I mean, the US has been irritated by our approach to digital regulation. Um, the world has been very aware of our approach to ESG. Um, certainly the carbon border mechanism, you know, is, it may well be leaky, Chris, it's also very unpopular in the wider world. Now, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but it certainly means that it needs some explanation, some socialization, and perhaps if that's to be packaged with more assistance, not just be a protective framework. Then there's really the question about some tensions between this, let's double down on industrial strategies domestically, let's play to our interests, and build up that domestic green economy and that political support for domestic green economy while simultaneously thinking about the cooperative outcome. There are tensions between strategic autonomy and climate partnership. And those tensions are heard somewhat in the US and Europe, but they're heard very, very loudly around the rest of the world. And I think we haven't addressed that. And that's where an interest-based approach to trading frameworks and policies and a values-based one are slightly in conflict at the moment, although I would say obviously that climate is of interest as well as a value. The last question that lurks behind this is who is the rule maker? Um, and I think the US has had an expectation of being a rule maker in global trade frameworks. The EU has seen itself as a, a global regulator, the Brussels effect. But in a lot of the fields in which we're trying to work now, and certainly at the scale of bringing down emissions globally, we're really trying to work with many, many other jurisdictions around the world, some of which are ahead of us in technologies or particularly in resources. And that seems to be a bit of a paradigm shift to pick up Elias's term for the Europeans, for the US, and the whole way we think about this, this context. So that's not going to your sort of how much is being spent and who's spending more question, but trying to pick out some of the layers here, Chris. Last quick comment, as I was listening to the presenters, I was thinking of two examples I've come across following this debate. One is some of the new things that are happening to drive green change and to do it in a way that advantages producers you wish to pick, technologies and producers. And that's the French measures for subsidies for what counts as green cars. And these are not just are they electric or not. 
it's also are the cars produced in manufacturing facilities that use clean electricity? It's the scope two emissions. And it's also how far do manufacturers' cars travel from the point of manufacture to the point of sale? In other words, what are their shipping emissions? These are very important to green outcomes, but they're new approaches. And then the other thing I've learned that really stood out for me is in the space of thinking about how this links to the circular economy. In the US, only about 5% of digital equipment is recycled. In Italy, that figure is 40%. So there are some things, to give the European bit here, which we're really good at in Europe. And in particular, Italy is excellent at electronics recycling. So let me flag that. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Jesse. Um, Christian, you've got a really tricky job as head of your electric at the moment, um, uh, because there must be an awful lot of conflicting voices coming to you. Um, on the one hand, you must have all your um, your wind clients coming to tell you that the whole world is falling out of their oyster. Um, we saw um, Orsted abandoning plans. Uh, our um, uh, wind turbine manufacturers are in difficulty. We've got supply chain difficulties. Um, and on the other hand, um, it's kind of tricky to um, produce a, um, a, a CCS gas-fired plant in Europe. Um, so, you know, with the context of this really difficult situation that we're in in the European electricity market, at a time when we need a vast amount of additional electricity, low carbon electricity to meet our goals, um, how do you see this approach that you have with the US with the net zero industry act to really subsidize and make and really easy subsidies? Huh? I mean, you know, you, you build a, a, a wind power plant, you get X euros a kilo. For, that X year is a megawatt hour for 10 years as a tradable tax credit. In Europe, you have to go through all the hoops of getting a state aid approval and all the rest of it. So what do you think the EU needs to do, if not level the playing field, but to um, make sure that our decarbonization really gives us benefits? Thank you. That's a, that's a straightforward question. <laughs> um, well, if, if we start from, from, from your first uh, observation about, uh, let's say, you know, what about the RA and, 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 and how envious are, are we? Uh, we had a delegation of group CEOs uh, coming to, to uh, Washington uh, beginning of October and um, had the opportunity to meet with the Deputy Secretary David Turk. Um, and and it was quite striking to see, frankly, for European CEOs, which are used to a very, very sort of strict regulatory uh, oversight um, approach uh, and relation to politicians, to see CEOs uh, and 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 let's say the top political level uh, on on such good and and friendly footing, uh, I would say. Um, uh, David Turk uh, described the um, uh, the RIA as a as a carrot and candy piece of policy, uh, which was what was possible in the in the US. And I think uh, the, let's say the, the the possibility, the political uh, room for maneuver is a decisive uh, factor in, in in what kinds of regimes you can create in different. Uh, geographies, but I can tell you that that the that the CEOs uh, of the European delegation were were looking at at this relationship uh, with the policymakers with with some envy because um, there is a perception that even if things have have uh, improved quite a lot and we've seen a lot of good legislation, frankly, come out in the last five years, that that um, that there is a tendency in 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 Europe to to regulate rather than than take the the, the perspective of of, uh, of the industry and try to understand what they really need. Um, so that was just an, an observation. Um, zooming out for a second, I think what what we're all grappling with, uh, I think, was captured very aptly uh, by a. Uh, one of the previous speakers, we are moving into a new economic era and, and, and 
Uh, some of these changes happen gradually, and we've seen the beginnings of this uh, over a few years, uh, but we were really catapulted into this uh, uh, last year. And, um, and, and from, from, let's say, uh, a, a gradually deteriorating situation uh, uh, over the last, I would say, decade, we, we all of a sudden found, us in, uh, found ourselves in, in a situation with, you know, with hot war uh, on the European continent, uh, escalating conflict all around us, uh, a rapidly escalating ideological, uh, let's say, rivalry uh, that, that has also been in, in, in the making for a few years, but, but really sort of, uh, let's say, uh, manifested itself with, with the way different parts of, of, of the world uh, choose, chose sides in, in, the, uh, uh, in the war um, waged by Russia against Ukraine. Um, on top of that, trade wars and, and, um, and an increasingly aggressive uh, industrial competition. Now, so, so all of that really sort of um, exploded, I would almost say, on, on, uh, uh, on the world economy last year and, and, and basically led to, to a, a, a very high-paced change uh, from, from what you could call a just-in-time uh, uh, economic paradigm to a just in case economic paradigm. And, and I think what we're all grappling with in different types of, of, of geographies is to find out exactly what is the balance uh, to, 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 to strike here. Um, from the European perspective, on the one hand, we are, uh, let's say, uh, of course, uh, reviewing all our supply chains now. We are looking uh, at how we can, um, we, let's say, bolster our economy and, and, and also appreciate lots of the efforts made with the NZIA and, and the Raw Materials Act. But, but I think at the core of, 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 the, of the European industry that I represent is, is a dilemma between those two conflicting economic paradigms, the, the just-in-time paradigm that we've been used to, uh, a market-based uh, paradigm, which is indisputably very, very effective at driving down costs. Uh, and then this just-in-case uh, paradigm, which is uh, basically uh, the new necessity in, in, a, in a world that is very, very quickly, uh, let's say, moving away from a rule-based world order and, and, and a globalization paradigm. So, so how to strike that balance on the one hand between becoming more, uh, let's say, uh, strategically independent uh, and, and on the other hand, uh, making it at a reasonable cost, because what we're running into full speed now with the, with the European energy transition is a cost discussion. Um, with inflation going through the roof uh, and, and uh, a much more unstable uh, economic environment, as you pointed out, um, the, the green no-brain projects are all of a sudden falling apart one by one. And, um, and we're seeing... Uh, we're seeing stalling uh, tendencies where we should be seeing acceleration uh, and, and how to square that and how to find out exactly how to, uh, let's say, how to counter that uh, tendency. I don't think we have fully, let's say, nailed that yet. Um, many of the, uh, let's say, proposals, uh, the new laws are helpful uh, each on their own, but none of them uh, and, and, all of them collectively are also not leading to the necessary environment that allows to do the necessary acceleration and um, and, uh, and 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 very frankly simply uh, taking the necessary investment decisions. People are holding back because the business models are crumbling uh, and and falling apart because of inflation and um, and. We need to do some deep thinking and, and fast acting um, uh, uh, in relation to that in order to ensure that, uh, that, that the energy transition does not grind to a halt rather than uh, accelerate. Uh, many thanks. I, I'm going to plagiarize, if I may, your just in time to just in case, because I think that's a really great uh, way of describing it. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I'll move to yes, of our last. Um, uh, speaker, uh, Joseph um, from the Wall Street Journal um, in London. So therefore, you have one foot on both sides of the Atlantic in a way. Um, how do you see from you know from the the press's um, side of the fence? How do you see the um, 
the relative merits of the two different um, approaches to this decarbonization and strategic investment. Um, and what do you see the main pressure points moving forward? Um, cool. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, yeah, from the press perspective, um, I'd say one of the main things that I've sort of, sort of really picked up in the last year is sort of how much attention has really gone into sort of critical critical materials, um, the sort of like I guess area, um, sourcing supply chains. Um, I know obviously everyone here works within the space, um, and so you know it can easily be sort of overlooked how much attention there is. Apologies, my dog's just trying to drink some water. Um, but yeah, it's um, you know, it's a, it's. I think you know, it's easy to, as I said, it's easy to overlook how much attention there is. Um, there's stories almost every day from every publication. Um, I think you'd even see it in sort of the tabloids. You know, people trying you new know, mining stories, which is quite strange, really, for me. Um, and yeah, I think again. The amount of money that's sort of going into this, I guess, on both sides um, of the Atlantic, um, it's yeah, it's quite incredible to really understand. Um, yeah, and in terms of the relative merits, I'd say um, <clears throat> from speaking to sources, quite a lot of the time, it's they seem to say sort of the Inflation Reduction Act is sort of slightly further ahead. Um, it actually sort of tells businesses what they sort of need to do, uh, what's available. Um, you can kind of see that with a few firms, say like VW moving to Canada, things like that, um, in terms of their EV production. Um, like it, it's a much clearer sort of prospect for them. Um, having said that, um, I think personally the CRMA is a really brilliant act. It's very specific. It very much endorses um, reshoring, um, something that you don't tend to see in a lot of, I guess, um, other sort of bills um it's yeah i think it both very good um there's definitely more to be done but yeah it's a uh, it's definitely interesting for, from the press perspective fantastic many thanks uh, yourself. uh unfortunately we have run out of time i i would got so many other questions for all of the four panelists but i'd like to thank um all four of you for joining us today uh and for sharing some absolutely terrific insights uh, so on that, Andres, I'll pass the floor back to you. Well, uh, and I will ask Marcia to make conclusions. Marcia. Um, yes, thank you, Andres. Uh, thank you, Christopher. And thank you to um, all the panelists for having captured the different aspect of the issue so richly. Um, I've learned really a great deal, and it's been um, inspiring to hear all of you Um you have thrown uh, a lot of, um, you know, uh, discussion on the table. Um, and so from my perspective, what I'm hearing is that we are dealing with a uh, polycentric conflict uh, with a framework that is based on scarcity and accessibility, uh, which is really probably unable at the moment to fully respond to this conflict. So we are not directly creating um, a conflict elsewhere, uh, but we are creating uh, ripple effects uh, that perpetuate over and over. So I've heard um, uh, speaking about energy security and strategic autonomy, uh, but also about circular economy and how and the influence uh, of the topic on um, human rights, but also on sustainability, on um, social and environmental uh, aspects and the involvement of trade-offs. Uh, so with responsible mining and production, uh, SDGs, but also how there is a need for the clean technology to um, scale up, uh, but this is like a balancing um, act basically uh, between an horizontal approach of open trade and robust competitions um, versus what Jesse defined as a value-based uh, trading system. Uh, so um, also we've heard about the trade relationship between the developing countries and developed uh, countries. So um, how um, Africa uh, must transition from uh, raw material export to a value addition to uh, its uh, its industry. Um, 
uh, we've heard about uh, emer the emerging trend of uh, subsidy competition among major world uh, regions. Um, so uh, really, really um, many, many topics could flow uh, from this uh, discussion. Uh, and I think all, all of these uh, would uh, deserve a lot more debate and, and further uh, questions. Uh, so I really hope that we can uh, return to the topic on um, another occasion. Uh, but for now, from our hand, this is it. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today. And have a great uh, evening or day, uh, depending on where you are. Thank you.